were dancing to the big sound, jiving in the big crowd down on Chopin Street. I've been there, I've danced there. It's quite a treat to see those great Chopin. Tonight we're taking a trip down memory lane. Described as the dancing mecca of the West, County Mayo was renowned for its luxurious ballrooms and popular show bands. Mayo's dancing history dates back to the early 1920s, when some of the first dance halls would open their doors. It would be, however, in the 1960s and 70s that the county would see an influx of ballrooms opening. Henry McGlade is travelling around the county, meeting the dance goers, couples, musicians, and proprietors of Mayo's ballrooms of dancing and romance. It was a huge scene in Mayo, you know, Jimmy Higgins referred to it as the land of a thousand dances. Uh, there was anything up to 80 dancing venues in Mayo, we'd say during the 40s, 50s, 60s, up into the 70s. And that was the one place, I suppose, where people would go to meet each other. It was very much part of Irish life at the time, you know, because no, no, nowadays, you know, you have the pubs and the discos to a lesser extent when, when they all open again. Um, and and um, that time, all of the younger set went to the dance halls. That, that, was, that was it, really, wasn't it? There was no other social outlet at the weekends. The dance halls were the, were the big thing. I think they meant an awful lot for people. It was the only outlet that they had at the time, apart from going to Mass, you know. And, uh, and we always looked forward to the dances for the weekend. Now, at that time, there were very few during the week. It was always the weekend. And I shaved on the side of the road with an ordinary razor and a flash of water, and I went to the dance in, in, in um, Pontoon. And there I, I met my wife, actually, uh, Patricia Tyner from Leithstrom that night in Pontoon. And uh, that's, all, that's always happy memories for me. And I can always recall that night, and that's 50, over 50 years ago now, now today. So it was, a, it was a huge dancing scene, it was a huge social scene, and it was a great time of excitement for people because this is where they got, they worked hard all day, then they got dressed up, they got ready, whatever, and headed out. Got, the ladies got their makeup on, and the men had to wear suits and ties. If you didn't go in with a tie, you wouldn't be let in. And some fellas used to wear ties and the fellow that hadn't a tie would wait outside till your man went into the toilet and dropped the tie out the window to him. There was big halls and small halls, parish halls and town halls, but Henry is travelling to the village of Bunny Conlon on the Mayo-Sligo border, where Big Tom made his very first appearance in the county. Prior to this hall, before it was built in 1949, there was four halls in the parish. There was two in the village, the Palace Hall and the Grand Central. Down at the bottom end of the parish then, there was a hall called the Emerald Hall, owned by the Higgins family. And at the top end of the parish, there was uh, the uh, Laurel Ballroom, which was owned by a family of the Loftuses, they were musicians. The history of the hall goes back nearly before my time. It has gone back to a gentleman that lived here years ago called Merton Judge. So he decided he was going to build a dance hall, a bigger and a better dance hall than the rest. 
So in 1948, he, taught, he, he purchased this site. We're probably fortunate. It's one of the only halls that has a dance annually in it. We started uh, playing a number of smaller bands, we'd say, and people like now, bands like, uh, we used to have bands here like um, the Vin Brogan and the Sanatones from Foxford, the Nairy Brothers from Foxford, you know. We had Phil Munley from Cross Malina. Bobby McCaffrey Banana, who was a, a, a regular here. One night then, uh, I was in the marine in a scrone at a dance, and um, Big Tom and the Mainlanders were playing. We booked a date in September of 67, and the fee was 50 pounds. And one of the bands said to the other, said to me, uh, is this Sligo? And I said, no, this is Mayo. I said, we're just inside the border, I said. So he turned to one of the lads and he said, uh, well, this is our first time playing in Mayo. Building a dance hall in an isolated area was not an obstacle. We're here in the Shamrock Ballroom in Durnamil, where my grandfather and my uncle Tom actually built this themselves. They got all the raw materials from around the area down the shores and they carted it all up and built it all with their own hands. On the 30th of June 1956, it was opened and my grandfather and grandmother ran the Shamrock Ballroom and their names was Pat and Mary Ann McAndrew. Now she was the queen of the Shamrock Ballroom. It actually started as a, as a joke. We had actually was a boss, the, the premises across the road there, but my father had thought there was a bigger yard in there than there was in this premises to discover when he actually went in to look at it, it was smaller. So uh, there were people asking us, you know, what are we going to do with it? And my father, mother was here and we got us one day and she said, just as a joke, you know, we're going to build a, build a dance hall. And it kind of started from that. Sunday night was the, was, was the dance night at that time. So you'd have, would say, people from, I suppose, Balavari, Bohola, uh, Kill Kelly, Bell, like, you know, kind of uh, a catchment area, if like I said, that people could, could cycle to it. There was, there was very few cares at the time. So basically they, they cycled into town, they left their bikes down at the old guard of the barracks. And well, like they were, obviously they were safe there. And after the dance, they cycled home again and that was it. It was often the case that when a proprietor of a ballroom changed, so too would its name. The Diamond in Kilchema was later named the Crystal Ballroom, while the Starland in Ballyhonus later became known as the Eclipse, to name just two. But one ballroom that has continued to keep its name to this very day is the Royal in Castlebar. The 19th of December 1963 was a historic day for our family and for Castle Bar and the West of Ireland in general. It was the, uh, the single biggest dance hall facility outside of Dublin. They used to compare us at that time to the, uh, the Arcadia Ballroom in Bray. It, 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 it opened to tremendous success with Butch Moore in the capital. But um, Joe Dolan was a particular favourite of mine. I remember one night I came over and I had a gabardine coat on me and uh, I had my pyjamas rolled up and I was flicking on and off the lights because there was no such thing as sequence lighting that time. And, you know, there were just coloured bulbs and we used to turn them off and on and off so fast that it ended up that I couldn't touch them because the switches were so hot. My first dance that I went to was to the Royal Ballroom Castle Bar on Sunday night, the 13th of July, 1967. And I cycled in with a few pals, right? And performing on stage that night, was the number one show band at the time and who would be arguably the number one show band during the great show band era, the Royal Show Band Waterford. And the, the uh, relief band on that night was the Blue Notes from Letter Frack. We thought, I thought they were very exciting. Somebody said, wait until the Royal come on stage. The trio, I mean, we did dances, we did the smaller halls, I mean, we, we didn't play any of the big halls and that. And I just thought, look at it, I'm young, I'll take a chance, go full time in the business. So I formed a band called the Abilene at the time, um, mainly local lads. We opened in, in July 1969 for the festival here in the Moylan Ballroom, you know, and that. And we were actually technically the first band to play in, 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 in Moyland and it was a great night, I'd say there were 2,000 people there. I liked Pontum Ballroom, not because it was only out the road, it was close, you know, and that, but there was a lovely atmosphere in it and I mean, you would never know it's there, you know, if you, want, if you, if you went that direction, it's just a green field again, you know, it's extraordinary, yeah. 
Ballrooms were very important in the social life of any parish. The parochial hall was the mainstay in rural life. Monsignor James Horne, a priest in Taurine, formulated the idea of building a dance hall in the village. It opened in 1951. Well, this is the famous Taurine Ballroom, which over the years, of course, was a mecca for dancers from all over the west of Ireland. And when you think about it, the biggest names from the show band era took to that stage every week. And they all, the dancers had their favourite bands. And of course, then there was a story that emerged during those great days about the devil appearing in this very ballroom. And there was all sorts of stories where it originated from. But the one I'm inclined to enjoy and believe is the one which involved the late Monsignor James Horne, who was involved in this dance hall as well. And that he put out the rumour that the devil appeared here and of course it got massive publicity not just here but abroad and it certainly didn't do any harm to the dance hall here because it went on to continue to attract huge crowds over the years. Sadly it's no more as a dance venue but it's good to see that it's been used for other events. Still to come on tonight's programme, Henry continues his journey around the county visiting Mayo's ballrooms of dancing and romance. The name Bros Welch is synonymous with the Schubert era in Mayo. He was the proprietor of the Arcadia Ballroom in Belcara and also formed the Bros Welch Band. It opened in October, the ballroom here, in uh, October, I think it was around the 18th of October, 1942. My father's played, Bros Welch Band played for the opening dance. Margot and the country folk was here because some of the lads were Mayo lads that was with the band at the time. Frank McCaffrey played in it, uh, our own band. The Miami, the Miami were here, yeah. Shortly before that trip. That's right, they were here on the 26th of June and it happened in, is it about four or five weeks later, God rest them lads. They were here, big Tom, uh, Roly Daniels, Hello Darling number one, hit, hit number one on the Monday. And they were here on the Thursday night. And so, oh. yes. There wasn't room to change your mind. There was that many people here. This was um, the only place that people could meet and dance and chat and talk and whatever, you know. And I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure there are. There are people that, I'm sure there are people in the parish here that um, probably didn't dance very few many places outside here and, as you said, met their, met their partners here. I used to see Pat at the dances. And I always thought in my mind he was very good looking. He had lovely hair, lovely wavy hair, black, jet black hair. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but the only thing was he never danced. So I could never get a chance to have a word with him. <laughs> the only thing I would see him across the church at Mass in Ballycroy, you would never miss Mass because you'd see all the talent. <laughs> <laughs> after mass and we'd have the crack but anyway um, that was okay then I I was dancing away at different ones that I knew well the Ballycroy people that I knew and uh, then what do you think I saw Pat and Pat never danced of course and what do you think I nearly fainted didn't he ask me to dance <laughs> And I, I was, got all fumbly and everything, and I thought to myself, God. And you brought me for a second dance later in the mm -hmm. night. The dances used to go on pretty late that time. And uh, I remember you said, would I have a mineral? That was the, the way it was in those days. As they say in the ballroom of romance, will you have a, a mineral and a carry cream? <laughs> but anyway, there was no Kerry creams that night, but we had the mineral and chatting away. But anyway, he asked me out, and here I am now, 53 years later, and we have four children. Then I remember when I was young and going to some of the dances, it was the same as the film in the, in the bottom of Ramas. The girls were on one side and the men on the other. And there'd be an awful burst of crosses on the musical status. Some would have to come back again because <laughs> they wouldn't get anyone to dance with. It's not just the dancing couples that like to reminisce of the showband era, but so too does the musicians. Henry's in knock to meet with John Kelly of the Niagara Showband. Hi Henry, 
it yourself that's in it. Come on in and we'll have a little chat about all the times. Yeah. All right, Henry. And the great music scene. The show band era. Never forget it. Never forget it. This actually is the show band era for us. And my mother, God be good to her, kept this. All right, I'd never have thought to do it. We have all the little halls and big halls we played in here. The Niagara on the road. Kong. Yeah, that was a popular venue, wasn't it? It was, Golden? the Golden Olive. Yeah. Nancy Murphy ran that. And was that a midweek gig or was it a weekend gig? That was a Sunday night. We, we did a Sunday night there. They, they used to run all, a couple of nights a week there. And uh, the Savoy and Clare Morris. Yeah, very few people would remember that. That, that was now. beside the railway line. Yeah. Because a couple of bombs came after that then in Clare Morris. They did, yes. Swinford Town Hall was another venue. Swinford Town Hall. That was... Uh, that was Farkins Hall. He was a tailor. And he had a men's shop and you know, all Farkins. And did he own the, that building? He did, I think, yes. yes. And how often would have been dancing there every week? Oh, there was, yes, there was, yeah, every week. Swinford Town Hall. Yeah. But sure, like, as I said, the, 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 the dance was the only place for a social gathering in those days. God, you, you played all the bonhams in Mayo. We did, surely. Could you come home week? That was a big one. Tory oh, and Ewell. Tory and And there, there we were then after winning the Eurovision down in Tory. Yeah, that was we, a big night, was it? We were. We, we played with her. It was our first yeah. appearance in Mayo. And this is the famous one now no. in, in Shaheen's in Boston. Very, very a, I mentioned that to a couple of people and none of them ever heard of it. Well, the Daisy Land, as the it is known, land. in Shaheen is the town land. And it was a little shed, but it was great for him, packed mm. pack to the rafters on, on, on midweek. And it was, it was on the Foxford Ballinay Road, just into the left. We, we called it the day to land ballroom. We called it a bit of controversy at the time because there was a lot of halls in Ireland called lands. There was the cloud land, the cuckoo land, the barrow land, and but we were thought we were going to challenge. We weren't challenged on it anyway. It went forever more as the day the land ballroom. Regular Friday night dances with small, average sized bands, not big bands, because it was too small to hold them. It had capacity for about 300. But we had some lovely, lovely local bands. Galway, Mayo, and Roscommon would be predominantly the bands that we have. We had, Pat Free, Lenny Grimes, Jerry and the Merry Boys from Mayo, the Outlaws, uh, a group called the Aztecs. We had the lads from Ballinaire, the Brinton Gabby and his group. And we had, of course, the, the bands from Chum. Well, the, that's where the homeland of the small bands was Chum, Ali Maloney, the Bandits, Raindrops, or Johnny Flynn, the good few more, Vin Brogan. Vin had his own band, and he lived just about, about a mile from the dance hall. So he'd come down the road with the equipment and set it up and he opened it for us and himself and his brother. Both of them have sadly passed away and he opened it for us. He had a lovely band at the time, quite a good band, travelled all over Ireland, managed I think by Eddie Lavelle at that point in time. If your band went down well, the young, particularly the girls, would come up and say to you, when are you bringing back such a band? Now sometimes they might have the eye on a lad on the band, more so than the music he was playing. So it, it, it was a strange setup for the whole asset, really. My father had the maple rented from Joe Gannon. He was a businessman here in town. He bought it in 1961, and uh, he had it. Then he ran dances, and he used to have the four penny hop on a Saturday. On a, Tuesday night, the four penny hops was on, and often he'd he'd be praying in the summertime that it'd make a shower of rain, because the farm was be out at the hay, and if the rain came, you see, it'd say, "Oh, to heck with it, we'll go into the four penny hop." My father played the sax, and he played the accordion. He could play a lot of different instruments, you know. The band was called the Pride of Erin then, so he 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 played up, up in Kilmain Hall. Uh, St. Patrick's Hall in Kilmain, and he played in uh, Parthry Hall in Tromakidi. And he played around the country, like he might, he played, he went to Chum now, he played in Chum a lot.
Hur du kör mix foxtrots och uh, foxtrots och slow waltzes och Sergio Venus och all that kind of crack. The bigger bands are booked for the midweeks to attract extra crowds, you know, Big Tom and all them were here on the midweek nights and uh, then the other bands were in. But it, it was a kind of, at that era when I would have been coming to go to some of them, there was also, uh, the country music was very, very popular at that time. All the big country bands like Tom and Gene Stewart and all those were Brian Call. Um, all of them would be flying at the time. But there was also, uh, as you well know, Henry, there was a, a, a similar middle of the road pop culture at the time, which had Gene and the champ Dale Hayes and the Champions, yeah, Sean O'Dowd and all those bands, Tweed probably a bit, little bit on the harder rock side of things, uh, the memories, all of those and uh, they all cater for a market which was great. Pete Brown was a legendary character here in town back the he years. He opened and actually the first ball in the Diamond Ball. The Diamond Ball and yeah. Pete, yeah. yeah. Pete would have been, uh, he had his own band, the Sundowners, they went to America as well and of course it was in that band that the the nucleus of the Royal Blues took shape with Doc and Doc Harland, Frank and Vincent Gill and the lads. They were local lads here as well. And you had Andy Creighton, who originally maybe out of more area, but of course then on was with Claire Morris, who was the manager of that band in later times. We'd be playing um, mostly on, on a Sunday night. That was that was the the scene at that time. There was, there was only dances on, on, on Sunday night. The, the, you, you couldn't go out on, on a Saturday night. So um, we'll be playing two, three, three nights a week. We'll be, there'll be, there'll be a Friday night and there'll be a Wednesday night. North Mio was a great area to go down and play around there. There was lots and lots of halls. Like we'd go to Glenamoy and uh, Durnamale and Ahos was a great one. And there was a hall in ba Bangareris as well. Uh, town hall there, and there was uh, Duhoma, I think, was was another place that that, that we used to go to. Uh, that's apart from the other halls like Mulrani and Akil down in uh, the Wavecrest in Akil and Bonacori. Tonight, Henry begins his journey in Kilchima at the Diamond Ballroom, where on the 6th of June 1963, Jim Reeves came to town but did not play. Little old dime, you're the last of a pocket that's <laughs> a story that's been told <laughs> on numerous occasions. But <laughs> and you have the real story. <laughs> well, the real story was he, Jim was booked to play here in Kilchima and he was booked to play in Sligo the same night. And he had, would say, a few pints on him, I suppose, going in. And they told him basically, hurry on here, you know, kind of, you know, you're going to sing here and you're going to sing in Sligo. And as you say, he, he threw a wobbly and decided he wasn't going to sing. When, when uh, Jim came in, the, the, the story in relation to the band goes that he asked uh, his, one of his, uh, the piano player in the band, uh, was the piano in. in fine work in order and he said it'll, it'll be it'll be okay and he's supposed to have said to him then is it is it perfect and he said I couldn't say it's perfect and with that Jim Reeves more or less said I'm not going on and skedaddled out the back door again well, my father went up on stage and explained to them what happened told them if you want your money back just you get the boxes of send the way out or if they didn't want to take the money they guess it would say a free a pass and the next night, they, if they came to the dance, they get him for half price. Or whatever, I can't remember exactly, but actually, he got a standing ovation. Your father? My father. So that's, but, but there is a famous story, the following morning, a local man wanted to know, would say, what had happened. And there was a local character, a man called Tommy, or Paddy Coyne, actually walking up the street, and somebody asked him, Paddy, what happened there last night? And his reply is still famous, the bloody piano wouldn't start. <laughs> Many dancing couples will hold Westport fondly in their memories as a dancing mecca in Mayo. It was home to several ballrooms. The Starlight, Belle Claire House, the Ideal Cinema, which doubled up as a dance hall, and of course, the Pavilion. My second dance would probably have been in the Pavilion in Westport because that was the place to go, was the Pavilion. Everybody knew about the Pavilion and they got all the big bands. This is the 
pavilion ballroom. The Pavi, it was known as locally, affectionately. Um, this was a mecca of dancing. It was tremendous inside. Tommy Tony was the man that, that, that ran this hall. And Tommy was a great character and, and knew the business very well. There could be up to 500 people in that building on a dance. And what he would do is close, well, this is what they said he used to do. He closed the windows and the doors. And so everybody would have to go for a mineral then, you see. So there was a huge markup in the mineral bar as well. I would have met Bindia on, I think, around January 1964. And uh, I don't remember who was playing. I don't remember anything like that, but that was the start of it anyhow. And we got engaged the following year and married the, in 1966. But uh, the pavilion was, it was famous everywhere. It was always packed. The Starlight, that was an extraordinary ballroom in the old because that was the first ballroom with a rotating stage where they could actually wheel the one band off and wheel the other one on. The opening night was um, Tony Chambers and his band, Finn Brogan and the San Antones, and then the great Dickie Rock in the Miami. And they opened, that was the first night. Saturday night, The Starlight, very popular, lovely bands, Sean O'Dowd, uh, Joe Dolan, Joe Dolan, the memories. Um, there was Gina Del Hayes and the Champions, and they were the live bands, the live show bands were absolutely brilliant because they put a lot of work into their music. Here we are now. We're in Belclare, Westport, and this was the venue here in early sixties. John Healy, a man, a businessman. I think he was from Dublin. He came here and he built the most luxurious. It was Belclare House Hotel. He had buses laid on to take people from all over the county to come here on these nights. Uh, I played here with Pat Friel. He would have had all the big bands here as well. Everybody from, from Philomena Begley and all, all the great country. And Westport was always a very country and pop. Uh, very much so. So we had all the bands. Just out the road from Westport was the Gaty Ballroom in Island Aide, a popular Wednesday night venue. However, many will remember a very special night with a very special visitor in 1950. In my time, Henry, I remember, it was Wednesday night was the Gaty Ballroom. We all were crowned all Ireland champions in 1950 when the beat loud on the scoreline 25 to 1 6. So they were, that was the first of their back-to-back -back and only back-to-back -back successes, right? And on that was uh, the Sam McGuire Cup arrived in unexpectedly. Sam McGuire was an unexpected visitor, right? At the night of the dance. At the night of the dance, and it created great excitement, naturally enough. But there was a link with Island Aidy in the ballroom, because one of the most pr uh, proficient footballers, high profile, and one of the most consistent wearing the Meagwell jersey at the time, was a local footballer, Peter Solon. I would take my own parish park in the former National School. We ran dances there from 1968 into early 1972. And I would be the book, you know, we'd done it really for social purposes, you know, to enhance the social life of the community. I'd be booking the bands, and the popular bands that played in park were the Merry Boys from Cross Malina, uh, John Kelly and the Niagara, uh, the Outlaws from Killala, uh, there was the Freelmen from Westport, and I actually had booked in January 71 the Blue Notes from Letter Frack, and they were the relief band to the Royal when I went to my first dance. There was a little link there. The Round Tower in uh, Turlock. It was in its day, it was really for a rural ballroom. It certainly was an elaborate construction, as we'd say. And it was officially opened on St. Stephen's Night, 1934. And it was a dress formal dance. In other words, the ordinary Joe Soaps of the community probably wouldn't be there, you know, Dickie Bowl and uh, all uh, suit, all, yes, uh, yeah. And interestingly enough, I was told by a historian now deceased that Lawlers of Nace were hired to carry out the catering on that particular night. There was many bands scattered around the county, including the Riviera in Ballyhornis, the Dixietons in Charlestown and the Pasadena in Ballina. 
Mayo, the land of a thousand dances, a term coined by Paramount show band member Jimmy Higgins. Henry is back in Ballandine to meet Jimmy, where the Paramount was formed, alongside manager Martin Donahue. Jimmy, this is where the old dance hall used to be. You're back 60 years later. Do you remember the first time playing here? I do indeed, yeah. It was uh, the early 60s, I'd say it's 1961. It was the local hall here in Ballandine. And we had big connections here in Ballandine because our manager was from Ballandine. It was Martin Dunno, the great Martin Dunno. He played saxophone and accordion. But then we went show band and he became the man, man, professional manager and we got all new suits and we're based in Tume. And we just played, as I said, Ballandine. We played the Savoy and Claire Morris. We played the Neil and we played uh, Ball and Robe. We played, there were hundreds, and well, maybe uh, certainly dozens of halls in. in in the, old. the early 60s I would have played here, it was called the Savoy Ballroom at that time and it was run by two brothers, Max, they were called maybe Billy Mac or two Max, but they used to run the Savoy Ballroom in Castle Ray and they used to, I think they used to rent this place and, and they ran regular nights every Friday night. It was a great venue, you mean you could have five or seven hundred people in here in those, those nights and we'd have played here with the Paramount but I distinctly remember seeing uh, Doc Carroll and the Royal Blues for the first time I saw them was here. There were so many halls, and we would be like not a first division man, like the Royal and the Capital and Joe Dolan and the Dixies. We'd be like, yeah, we'd be down yeah. second or third division. Royal Blues went straight in at the number ten. <laughs> they were a top division man, but we had so there was lots of second division halls, so there was plenty of work. Henry McGlade's tour of Mayo's ballrooms of dancing and romance continues. The dance was a social outing for many people around the county. They would cycle to the dance, walk to the dance, and in later years travel by car and hackney. Some were even lucky enough to meet their future partner at the dance. Neat dress was essential in a lot of ballrooms, right? So the boys would come with their suits, collar and ties. This was a photograph that was taken here in around 1966-67. Yeah. And uh, it just goes to show at the time, this is a, a, a group of us here, you know, and while we'd only have one suit to our name, but we wore it to the dances and, and to mass, I suppose. And, but when you, look, when you look at it there, um, everybody was dressed in a, in a, in a, in a shirt and tie and a, and a suit. And that was the dress that was uh, expected that you'd, yeah. you'd, you'd go out in. You know, today um, they go out in anything and torn jeans and everything else seems to be the the end thing, you know. And then what came into fashion was the Polonic, and that became trendy in fashionable terms. When I would be home, it was holidays, I, would, I worked in the cloakroom, and what you would have maybe, you would have men's coats, you'd have maybe three, four, five hundred coats, <laughs> and everyone was there coming in, you had to give them the ticket. And of course, that wasn't too bad coming in, but then everybody wanted to get out at the same time going out, and that's where the mayhem started. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, fellas lost their tickets, and you'd be, you'd be trying to tell them, you know, you have to wait until everybody else basically is gone <laughs> before you can get your coat, which didn't go down too well sometimes, but we survived. All the fellas would come home from England, all the locals would come home for Christmas, and they would be all dolled up in all the latest fashions with the three piece suits and the winky picker shoes and everything. And we thought, yeah, we thought they were fabulous. So we just cast all the locals aside and danced with them. And at the end of the night, there'd nearly always be a row. Many ballroom proprietors found it difficult to remain open due to immigration in this country. But when the men would return home from England, the dance hall was the first place they would visit. It was called the Shamrock Ballroom because there was a lot of immigration at the time and this was the meeting point when everyone came home, hence the Shamrock, Ireland. When I was a young fella uh, back in the early, early 70s, the place to go was either Dublin or London. We used to come home every year, uh, around the Christmas time you'd be home or you'd be uh, home during the year, but the place to go was Pontoon. That was the, what they used to call the dance, dancing mecca of the West. But when I went back to London, you would talk to them and, you know, you'd see with a lot of them uh, uh, a bit of a loneliness and they'd be talking about that. But it was, it was, they would be talking about the next time they would come home and what they would do and what they wouldn't do and who, who was left back there. And the, at the time they made a phone call back, but it was no mobile phone, but they'd make a phone back to see how things were going. And, you know, it, 
it was kind of home from home, you know, because we had the kind of the Galty Moor in, in Cricklewood and uh, the Gresham up on Holloway Road and places like that, you know, but things like that. It, it, it was, it was great, a great time in Ireland. It was a great time. We, money wasn't too plentiful, but, you know, the quality of life was, I think, a bit better than today. I, I, I firmly believe that. Sunday night was a particularly popular night in the county to go dancing. Sunday night was a huge night here in Durnamil, so everyone would get dressed up and get their glad rags on and head off to the Shamrock Ballroom. And uh, they used to come from all over, all over the place, so maybe Caratig, Ockleam, Glynis, Glynamoy, Sala, all over the place. They used to cycle, walk, however, they didn't care as long as they were here. They used to cycle from Tier now and Kina to the dances. Tierna would be about 33 miles and uh, Kina would be coming from a different angle but it be, wouldn't be much short of it either. The ladies met a fella or fellas and went home on the bar of the bike and they forgot to bring their own bike home and, but they'd come back a few days later and there was no locks on field gates that time and they'd go in it, you could see the bike there at 8 o'clock in the morning a few days later and to be gone at midday. Distance was no trouble, type of thing, Henry. You know, when we look back on how we got there, we had great mental strength, you know, type of thing. No throwing in the towel. On Sunday night, the 7th of July, I went to my fort with two pals as well, same to pal. We cycled down to Pantoon. And we didn't want to bring the bikes because they weren't what you call top of the range bicycles, may I say, right? We'd parked them about a, a quarter of a mile, the park side of Healy's Hotel, in a gapway type of thing, you know. And when it was time to come home to reconnect with your bicycle, there was difficulty <laughs> in finding the right gap to go into type of thing, you know. But for months we came on our mode of transport. It was great delight. But importantly, we enjoyed the dance, the music, and to be out on the floor type of thing, you know. There was a wonderful atmosphere. Well, I'd have to get a bicycle ready and get, get ready for the dance. We are something that you could get. You had an awful lot of clothes, like you had much choice. I'd wait until I see a few bicycle lights coming over the road and we go together with a flash lamp on the bicycle and we'd more or less hide the bicycles because someone might take them and put back a bad boy. We had a little spot for, for hiding them. There was kind of hackneck here at that time. There was a few, so he might, this, this man would bring, if, if, if a fella had a load in a car, he mightn't be even a hackneck car, but if he had the keys of his car going into the dances, he, he'd shake the keys and he'd show that he, he had a load. So he'd have to pint out then the fellas. Even if he hadn't a load, he could just say, well, you, you were with me and you were with me. He'd have to show that he had about five or six, and he'd get in free then. There could be nine or ten or eleven in the car at the time. Anthony to get, get away to go there. A car coming that always, they never pass on the road, that might put you in the boot maybe, or if there was a van. I know we often got to see it with Peter Costello. He was he had an ice cream van and we used to often go in where they put the ice cream. There might be six or seven of us in the back. Do you know, that's the way it was, we were coming up from Westport. So we used to go dancing in Castle Bear on the TF on a Sunday night. And uh, Westport then would dance in the, uh, the Starlight Ballroom. Yeah, that was a great place. We didn't care how we got there. It, we, we, as long as it was a steering wheel and four wheels. We all jumped into the car. No safety, no health and safety that time. It was, don't ruin my mascara. Uh, don't, don't ruin my skirt, blah, blah, blah. Went to the Starlight, got out. There would be about maybe four, maybe two or three hundred cars, vans. And then you'd see all these people just getting out of these cars. There'd be about 15 or 16 people in one car. They'd buy a ticket in one place and they'd, they'd swap. They'd swap the ticket because you get a pass out. So you get a pass out and you go down to the town hall and you'd see how the talent was down there. And you'd have your pick and if you didn't like it down there, you could come up to the Maple again. So they were going up and moving up and down all night. They weren't far away, the Maple, and you'd be down there in three minutes. Like. They were on our side by side. Reek Saturday night, people climbed the reek, they came down and went to the starlight after. 
and there'd be sweat on them and there'd be dust flying and burgers and onions and the smell of onions and burgers and perfume and B.O. and sweat. It was, but it was brilliant. Then Sunday night we, we go to the TF and that was absolutely trying. The TF was the place on Sunday. There would be buses, cars, the TF, there would be cars going way down the road. It, it was capacity. Yeah, it was, it was really thousands, capacity. Like, not hundreds of thousands. Oh yeah, oh, it was thousands, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was thousands and uh, it was it was always a good occasion. It was a Sunday night and uh, down through the years, the, the, the Sunday night was uh, very popular in, in Clare Morris as well and uh, in Kong, Belmullet. But every night of the week was popular that time, you know. I went through a, a phase whereby I was, I was booking bands for 22 venues, 22 dances a week, all across the west of Ireland, and that's where I got my, 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 my thirst for the business, and uh, it stayed with me ever since. Patrons came to the door, and uh, this was the ticket office here, and he paid for herself, and whatever it was, two shillings or five shillings or ten shillings at the time to the old money. Then he came to here, and we took the ticket from here. His two tickets, they got a ticket there and paid. So the ladies went, ladies on that side, you can see. And of course, the gents had to go this way. No, no such thing as he went in with or one way. That all didn't happen. And the mess inside, the band was playing. And then after a while, when it got a bit and crowded, straight across, and sometimes there was a bit of a stampede. And you know her yourself that, Fellas had the right on such a lady to dance and some other guy could have just got there before him. And, but anyway, and that, that was the way it was. And then he took her out on the floor and he danced around and the band played three tunes and, this, and he danced and talked and he got to know little things and I'm sure she did too. So after the third dance, then the band says, that's all for now, take a short break. And then she went back that side and he went back this side. And, Next minute the band announced then, now we're going to do a slow foxtrot. And of course, straight away the slow one, that was nice for the slow foxtrot. He had his eye on such a lady, and nice for the, for the lie-in, as they say, he'd keep close and be talking. So uh, he'd be out the front maybe for that particular one. He'd be gone across like a shot. He got her to dance with him, and then he might make his move if he liked. But he, if he liked the lady, he might like to Hold on. And of course there was the traditional girls on one side and boys on the other side. And there was a scrum to get over to the Cayeni, right? And some would be your fancy in the eyes of the female, others may not. In other words, you didn't get a yellow card, but it was an equivalent. <laughs> there would be a mad rush from that side across here, knocking one another down trying to get across to get a girl. And maybe when you got across, some fella, a mother fella had got her. So, <laughs> it was, <laughs> as, as they say down here, it was Cat Melodian. <laughs> it was, uh, it, there were great facilities and there were great outlets, you know, during that era, you know, and we enjoyed them. And all my friends, you know, we had a great, you know, I had a lot of friends and both women and men and, you know, we always enjoyed, there was a great old spirit there all the time, you know. You get the odd refusal as well, you know, but you kind of knew on, on the person's face as you were coming closer, whether she would <laughs> say yes or no, you know, you knew by the expression. After a while, they, you get a bit of experience and you can read, the, read their faces, the expression of their faces, you know. And I, a lot of the women too, those times, if they didn't want to dance with the fella, they'd run around the back, you know, when they see them coming. So they just run around the back, you know, the back of the crowd, the, 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 the women themselves, you know, to get lost. The women would be one side and the men would be the other side. And uh, we, we always had somebody like, we'll say, a certain men that should come across the dance hall to you, you know, and give you a dance. And then there might be a few more that should do likewise. And then it should come to ladies' choice. And whichever of them men that should give you a dance, you'd be looking at them and you'd be saying, OK, I'll... I'll uh, I'll give, yeah. I'll, I'll give one of them now ladies' choice, yeah. you know. And I kind of call my, one of my first dances actually was to Valley Castle. And in Valley Castle there were uh, at least three to four men to a woman, you know. 
So in that sense, there was a fierce shamazel, and if you weren't careful, you get knocked down with the rush, you know. Sometimes the men would be sitting on one side and the women would be on the other side, and they'd be viewing them up to see, to pick out a good dancer, like, you know. You could be lucky, like, and you'd get a bad dancer, and that was awful. Right. But uh, I don't know, we learned to dance um, fairly fast. In our own ballroom in Charleston was a great spot and great entertainment and of course that time there was no transport so the nearest ballroom was the place to be and Charleston was a great spot, it was always crowded, they came from Swinford, Tabricory, all over and there was plenty, plenty of women there and you, know, you never shot a woman. If you weren't in at 8 o'clock you were late like, of course eight to, I think it was 8 to half 12 it was that time. And of course if you were keen on a, a girl you'd bring her for a mineral the mineral bear. That was another fourpence. <laughs> but once you brought for the mineral, you were sound. The night was fixed, and you, you, you had your date for the night. The dances were good fun. There was no, you know, you met, I met Mary in Westport, and a lot of other Casper people met their, met their girlfriends in it. And Westport was always a nice place to go to, Henry. You'd, you'd really never get into trouble, like, you know. The dances started at 10 o'clock, and they went on until 2 and 3. Sure, you'd be going up 3 o'clock in the morning. You'd be leaving home. My girlfriend's nearly trying to get up, Henry, so it was like, you know. But the music was good. It was kind of, I suppose, a lot of bands at that time based on music on Glyn Miller. It was our night out. We were we weren't, we weren't drinkers, we just lived for the, yes. to go to the Central Ballroom. Well, my favourite band was, I loved Johnny Collins, I loved him, I loved Butch Moore, um, definitely uh, Dickie Rock, I liked him, Eileen Reed, and uh, in the latter years, Brenda Jine, being a rest common person, and um, and the Clipper, and of course, Big Tom was number one, and Brendan Boyer. Brendan Boyer, his huckle book. And it was hard to master the huckle book was. No wonder I ended up with a hip problem. There were three halls in Bermuda at one stage. There was Tuffy's Hall, and I can recall uh, uh, later in the, maybe in the 69, 70, going to dance in, in Tuffy's Hall, and there was a galvanised roof in the hall. And uh, I remember at times, during winter times, there was a shower of hailstones. You couldn't hear the music, it sounded out the music, you know, with the sound against the galvanised. The love story of Nora and Michael O'Malley began right here in the Arcadia Ballroom in Belcara over 57 years ago. Today they are back in the ballroom to meet with Henry and relive their dancing days. I used to be looking in the windows of the hall here, you know, we had no money that time, so we'd be looking in the windows. But I started working in a garage in Castlebar, so I got a few pounds and came into the dance. And we came here and I met Nora. Michael was always uh, one that used to always give me a dance. So, and he was this night he was here and uh, he just said to me, uh, are, you, are, are you going home or something tonight or something to that effect? And he was, and uh, I said, no. So Michael had a car, which was, well, he was posh, unusual, then. posh, yeah. He was posh <laughs> then, yeah, yeah. He, he usually had a car. And, uh, I said, okay, so, so, anyways, he said, I'll bring you home. I got, seemingly, I must have got a seat out along with a few more girls. So I said to him, uh, okay, but I have a few more girls with me. I said, will you bring them home? And we were going to the hospital where I was staying. And he said, right. So we were going up by the <laughs> old post office <laughs> in Castle Bar, and there was at least, I'd say, maybe three more women now with me. And next thing, going up at the old post office, the car stopped. So out we out had to get, <laughs> we had to get, and we pushed the car up the hill, the four nurses, and we got him going again. So that was the first night. So after that, then we started going out together. And how does it feel to be back here now in the Arcadia Ball yeah. in Belcar, Lovely. where it all started for you, your love story began? Yeah. Yeah. 56, is it 56, 57? 57, 57, 57 years, years yeah. Later. How does it feel? What's going through your head now? Yeah. Unbelievable, yeah. is all I can say. Yeah. And it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. And it was beautiful that time. Well, but it's, yeah. it's, it's gorgeous. Yeah. And it was a lovely hall. I have uh, memories of dancing in the Hashu Hall, French Hill. And I have a little poem here about it. It's now 
gone, so I'll just read it for you. That old dance hall <coughs> in French Hill, where we will never dance again. It's not because we're old and grey, it's because that hall is wiped away. To stand there now and look around, it's a sad and lonely sight to see cattle graze so peacefully where we danced on Sunday nights. The lads and girls from miles around will come to that old hall. You could see 200 bikes or more parked along the wall. The hall inside was whitewashed. It made the place so bright. The paraffin oil and rinse made the floor just right. The foxtrots and the tango, the waltzes and the sit, we all got out upon the floor and gave it all our best. The dance that went on all night from nine o'clock till three, and when they played the soldiers' song, the daylight you could see. So good luck to all who danced there. We have memories of it all. Those nights are gone forever, just like the Harshall Hall. Over 57 years later, Nora and Michael O'Malley have made their way back to the Arcadia Ballroom in Belcara to take to the floor for one last dance. There were great cheers, there were innocent cheers, and uh, uh, there, was, there was some fantastic um, characters and some great bands played here, and um, uh, it, it, it was great, it was, it was, uh, the, the swing in 60s was a, was a great era, um, an, in, an innocent era, and um, you know, uh, I know things move on and you have to change and all that type of thing, but um, uh, there was a period there from, from you know, 60, 63 up to, up to 70, like they were, they, were, they, were, they were great, like they were great. Sadly, a lot of the bottoms are gone, but in some ways, and I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be pulling no punches, sometimes, in some cases, the ball and proprietors themselves fell down. They didn't upgrade them or enhance the comforts type of thing, which did become popular, say, in the established hotels and lounges and that, you know. So some of the boys, it was just four, four walls and the toilets and the stage type of thing, you know, so there wasn't, and, and, and seating, you know. It was basic. A lot of the small ballrooms would have shut down at that stage and in 1971 Pab Court opened mm -hmm. so that I've taken over to this taken over from the smaller ones mm -hmm. and um, I had a few old dances there myself and um, I was actually the reigning Miss Pab Court there and it was a festival they used to be on in Belmullet and they'd all gather that the last night there and have a big dance there. Many locals found it difficult to see the decline and ultimate closure of their favourite dance hall and ballrooms in the county. Anne Meehan recalls the emotion on the night that the Central Ballroom in Charlestown closed its doors for the last time. The 10th of January 1997 was the, a, such an emotional night. There wasn't a person that didn't cry. That was kind of the older group with memories. They were very emotional. 
because they said that Charlestown would never be the same without that social aspect, because the singing pubs, as we used to call them that time, had come on the stream. But there was a lot of drink involved, because you had to go and have a drink in those pubs. You could dance and there was good music, like usually one-man bands and things, but nothing could compare with the night out in the central ballroom, Charlestown. I decided to pen a little poem about that night, because I like a bit of writing, and I used to do a bit for the newspaper. And Elsie McTighe, my friend, we were always very good friends with the beat and the beat and everything. So we decided we'd get up on stage, very brave. Now, there was no drink or anything, but we got up there, and we did this for Big Tom. And it was absolutely the highlight of the night. A huge crowd there. A huge crowd. When you look down, actually, it, they were like ants. It was absolutely packed out. You couldn't put your hand in your pocket. Uh, the night that the Charlestown uh, Central Ballroom closed, I wrote a few verses about the dance hall closing and the memories it had for Charlestown people. Um, where two counties meet with the sound of the beat, of the flying Carlton, a band from afar. In 1949, for that very first time, the central ballroom doors were ajar. Show bands like the Drifters, Big Tom and Doc Carroll, all pro provided music fantastic. Brendan Boyer's hooker book was top of the pops and to dances it ended like magic. January the 10th, 97 is a date to remember for immigrants now far away to return once again and meet up with the old friends and relive those once happy days. When Panther opened the bit in the 62, uh, a massive area, it goes from here into the lake almost, like it's a huge area, acreage, I, I can't afford to figure on it, but you could have 2,000 people, a 1,000 cars, you know, massive area, along with buses like, uh, and it was demolished bit by bit, yeah. block by block. Yeah. And then the, the council then took over and demolished it, yeah. and it's all buried there. They, they never took a bit of it away, it's all buried there, roof and, and walls and the whole lot. Probably 70, 78, 79, 1980, yeah, during a couple of years dancing. Uh, we'd go to Foxford first. If you had five pounds with you, seven pounds was enough. And you'd have a couple of pints and then you got your lift out to Foxford, or out from Foxford to Pantone. And you'd done your better dancing then. And then we wouldn't have a lift home. We'd walk home. Myself and Michael Q was a mate of my next door neighbour of mine. We'd walk home every Saturday night, most Saturday nights. We didn't have a car, we didn't care. So Tom, this is the original Moylan Ballroom you played all those years ago, the opening night. That's exactly it. Uh, this, this ballroom opened in December of 1969. You can almost see kind of two rooms there, which were the box office there on the right-hand side. Um, yeah. See, the, see the, the, the squares there on the right-hand side? And that was the main entrance there, and the stage was at the far end. And so that. people could still park along here, could they? They could, the yeah, and, and even at the back as well. All right. And, yeah. and I, I dare say maybe along this road as well, you There's know. There's 2,000 people here. They're they'd have to park yeah. along across the line of road as we are here, yeah, and, indeed, yeah. I remember every minute of that first night with the Royal Show Band, with the Tom Kelly Trio, we opened it and that, and I suppose there was about 2,000 people there that night. And did, did, you, did you watch the Royal Show Band on stage? You ah, yes, ah, they were very good, yeah. They were very good at the time. Brendan Boyer was a tremendous front man, you know, and that. And, and uh, there were great days. The, the place rocking. Ah, oh, there's no doubt, no doubt about that. Yeah, no doubt about that, yeah. Just like the Moyland, many of Mayo's other ballrooms have a new purpose. Some, however, have continued to hold dances to this day. We run our annual show dance every year here, and all of the top names come here. And this is the first year we haven't had a show dance in 71 years. Maybe not as much as the older people comes now, but what is coming is the youth. And last year here, we, we couldn't get in anymore in here. We had to keep, as everyone knows, inside the, insur uh, the insurance. But at the same time, it's fantastic to see a younger, uh, a younger, a younger generation coming in. And here we are now in a dance hall. It was opened in 1942, Henry. And most of the dance halls are all gone now. 
indeed, the show bands. And here we are. <coughs> I get a bit lonely when I say this, but here we are, the Bros Welch Band. We're still playing and doing our bit. And hopefully we'll continue on as long as we can with God's help. There's not many dance halls now because they've gone into hotels and uh, there's bar exemptions and, you know, it's, it's, it's not the way as it used to be. Um, there'd be a limited amount, but the, mostly they've gone into concerts and a lot of the Irish bands, like say Brendan Shine, uh, started the concerts in England very, very early in his days. And while he played the dances in Ireland, he did the concerts in England and gradually he played in England all the time and uh, provincial England and the Irish community and the Irish halls over there. He did concerts and uh, Dominic Kerr was the same thing. Frank McCaffrey from Westport was very popular over there. And um, that's how they survived over and back on the boat, really, you know. The young people were going to the disco because it was a whole new phenomenon. And um, at that time, you know, for, for, for a few years we were running the dances you know, in the main ballroom, and we were running the disco uh, upstairs. So gradually the disco took over and we were doing four nights a week with disco. But then um, there was always a market for them, but it was slightly different that basically we, we ran as part of a concert tour. So we started developing the, uh, the existence of a theater and we developed the Royal Theater. Uh, that time way back in the, uh, I think it was the late 90s, that stage. And um, we, we continued to grow from here. We renovated the theater three times. Uh, and the last time was in 2008 when we knocked the whole place and rebuilt what we have here today. And uh, we, we just didn't, had to keep up with the times and we felt that if we didn't uh, expand and survive, well then we were going to die. And we weren't prepared to do that. Pat brought Gwyn to the concert side, side of it and it just grew after that into theatre, into I suppose West End shows, West End productions, into fetches, into concerts, drama and whatever else you could think of. We expanded into a 2,200 seated theatre or a 3,500 seated and standing theatre which would be something similar to what the ballrooms would be um, back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, it'd be similar crowds. Um, so they, it just went from, from dancing really to a seizure concert. While things have certainly changed since the 1960s and 70s, the memories remain the same. In the mid-1980s, the dancing scene changed. Discos became popular in hotels, while fully licensed bars were now available. The dance halls unfortunately closed one by one, the bands broke up and the dancers moved to more comfortable surroundings. Over the last three weeks we have travelled the length and breadth of County Mayo, hearing the stories behind Mayo's ballrooms of dancing and romance. Do you remember dancing the night away in one of Mayo's 80 ballrooms scattered around the dancing capital of Ireland? All that's left for us to do is to say good night, God bless and safe home. <laughs>